everybody. Um, we are recording and we have fantastic turnout, fantastic interest in this event. So thank you so much to everyone for being here and I'm sure it's going to be a, an incredibly informative session. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Amber Fletcher. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Regina. And I'm also the academic director of the Community Engagement and Research Center or CERC for short. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this, the second in our sociology conversation series. The objective of these sessions, of, of these events, is really to facilitate conversations between academic and community audiences to bring us together for the purpose of community engaged learning and discussion. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of, of CERC, the Community Engagement and Research Center, and Lynn Gidluck, who's been very involved in organizing this event. To all of the organizers, thank you so much for your effort. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to the main organizer, the person behind this event, Dr. Cindy Hansen, who is a professor of sociology here at the University of Regina. And uh, to thank you so much, Cindy, for your effort in organizing this event. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Amber. And I wanna welcome everyone to the event tonight. And uh, we had 125 people registered, so I'm thrilled. Um, tonight, we're here to talk about engaging with Métis communities and the duty to consult. It shouldn't be clear cut. Um, I would like to start by doing a land acknowledgement. The land we're on reflects our histories, and tonight we gather to engage with the Métis and to learn about how to, how to engage in a better way, and at least in a good way. I'd like everyone to acknowledge the land they are on. Most of us are here around Regina and the University of Regina and are on Treaty 4 or Treaty 6 lands, lands of the Cree, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and homeland of the Métis. In the spirit of this acknowledgement, I'd like to invite people near and far, and we have people all over Canada at this event, to acknowledge each other by posting where you are in the chat. So if you can just go to the chat button at the bottom and just say where you are, if you're in Treaty 1, if you're in unceded territory, wherever you might be. And I see we've got a lot of people here in Treaty 4, Treaty 6, uh, Treaty 4 and 6, 6, 4, 6, Laloche, Illacross, site of Treaty 10, Treaty 4, Treaty 7, Treaty 1, Treaty 4, Treaty 6, Illacross, Saskatoon, Treaty 6, Ancestral Land of the Michif, Treaty 4, Regina, Halifax, Treaty 4, Métis since 1776, Treaty 6, Treaty 4, Treaty 3, Treaties, I think we've got all the numbered treaties here. Uh, Wood of Flesh, traditional buffalo hunting grounds of the half breeds, um, home of the Michif, unceded Algonquin territory, Northern Ontario, Treaty 8, Metis land of lesser slave look. And we also have in our audience the best looking Metis in Canada. We're not sure about that, but okay. <laughs> Okay, so our chat is going to close now um, so that we can hear the speakers. Um, the chat will again be opened um, towards um, the end of the last speaker. And if you have questions, you can post them in the chat at that time. Or we'll also have uh, opportunities for you to turn on your camera and say your questions uh, after the speakers have um, spoken. So we'd really like you at this point to turn off your microphones and turn off your cameras. We have several people helping out and Megan Kajewski, um, one of the people on the screen here, if you have any technical issues, you can um, still contact her through the chat and she can try and help you out. So, um, and if you, you, you're on the screen and then all of a sudden you're off, it's because we actually can have little buttons that can do those kind of things. So 
Um, so that's it you know, if you have uh, technical issues. Um, we'd like people, if possible, to put their names on the black squares. So if your name says iPhone, there's a good chance that that's not your real name. And if you could just wiggle your, your mouse, uh, three little dots will appear on your black box. And if you go on there, there's one of them says rename. If you click on that rename, you can change your name from iPhone to something else and you know um, maybe closer to what it is. So that would be really nice if you would do that. Um, um, so I think that's it in terms of the, the technical details for, for right now anyway. Um, what I'd like to do now is each of the panelists is gonna uh, talk for, for roughly 13 minutes each and then we're gonna have questions. Um, so we'd like to start um, tonight. Um, I'm gonna introduce um, the first speaker and that's Caitlin Harvey. Caitlin Harvey is a Métis lawyer and geographer from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Her areas of research and practice are mainly around the intersection of natural resource development and indigenous human and constitutional, um, constitutional and Aboriginal rights as well as comparative climate change, mitigation and adaptation, law, policy and liability. Um, Kristen, can, can I ask you to go first? Um, did you mean Caitlin? Caitlin. <laughs> okay, sorry, I thought, oh geez. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you, Cindy. Uh, and and for, for everybody for, uh, for having this uh, event this evening and for, for attending. Um, there are a lot of familiar names on the call, um, people that I have worked with in the duty to consult process, people that I've studied with, um, people that I've chatted policy with, and uh, a lot of names that I'm not familiar with. Um, glad to see you all here. And it's exciting to to see that there is this, uh, this much interest in uh, you know, the government's uh, consultation process with uh, Métis communities. Um, I'm going to try to keep my, my discussion short. I have a tendency to, to ramble a little bit, not ramble, but chat. There's, there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of history here. There's a lot of emotions here. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that when we're talking about the duty to consult, uh, we have to keep in mind that, um, that this is not an easy topic for a lot of people. Um, you know, and so when we're when we're going forward with these conversations, we have to keep an open mind and we have to understand that we are all learning. And um, I think that's really important as uh, the conversation um, proceeds this evening. So um, just a little bit more information about me. Um, a lot of my research has been in the areas of climate sciences, sciences and uh, exploring the legal and political frameworks that have led to the climate and resource development related problems and social tensions that we're experiencing today. Um, most of my legal practice has been in the areas of criminal law, some uh, wills and estates. And recently I've had the pleasure of working with Doug and Jason who are presenting uh, after me this evening um, and uh, working with several different Métis communities in Saskatchewan on um, some duty to consult matters. So, you know, we're here to talk about how the duty to consult operates in the context of uh, Métis communities, which Doug and Jason will, will speak to. Um, but before we, we get into that, you know, it is really important that we, we understand the context of this discussion from a historical perspective. Um, you know, when we're talking about duty to consult, where, where does this duty come from? Why do we have it? Why do we have section 35 in the first place? And you know, when you, when you understand that duty to consult was um, designed as, a, as a, a temporary vehicle for governments and industries and communities to, to still work together and get things done. Like that was the original intention um, in, uh, in, in the court process. And that has now been um, the focus for a lot of the, the discussions um, with government and, and communities 
um, instead of resolving the more substantive issues of, of the right to um, determine how, uh, how development progresses or, or not. And so we're talking about the duty to consult. We have to understand that there is this uh, power imbalance that is inherent in the duty to consult um, legislative, or I guess it's not even judicial uh, framework and, and policy frameworks that exist uh, for that duty to consult to operate. So we've got the, the court saying this, there's a duty to consult, but the, the governments are deciding what that process looks like and um, the, the structure, how many people are employed it, to consult, um, the content and scope of that consultation, uh, the time um, that is allotted, the, the resources, all of the, you know, what forms that consultation process is determined by government. Um, before we even start talking about the role of communities um, in, in that process. And so when you understand that this, this consultation process, it, it is created or it is the result of, of a long history of, uh, of, of law and, and, and courts trying to find a way to strike a balance between um, the, the crown and, and you know, the queen's law um, going out across what is now Canada and um, having uh, you know, uh, these, these processes of colonialism of trying to find ways to justify the crown's imposition of sovereignty over indigenous people. Um, that is, you know, the, the, the context for these discussions. We've got um, White Man's Law. I'll just say White Man's Law, uh, a book by Sidney Herring. Um, it's, uh, it gives a really interesting historical background on how uh, indigenous people were treated in 19th century Canadian jurisprudence and how the, the law has developed really in a way by, by courts to, to try to find ways to justify the crown's imposition of sovereignty. We know about the doctrine uh, of discovery and how the, the courts have really you know, aided in, in this process of, of colonization and justification for um, imposition of, uh, of sovereignty. And we've got now you know, the Canada inherited this law over time. And um, the, the framework that we're working in right now in terms of constitutional rights and, and jurisprudence, uh, judge-made rights and, and laws, um, legislative rights and policy frameworks for giving effect to those rights, it's, it's very complex. Uh, there's a lot of history there. And um, when you have a... Uh, an understanding of, of the, the Constitution, you know, Section 35 was the result of a very long history of jurisprudence that um, courts were saying, you know, we need to have some kind of framework, governments, please give us some legislative framework where we can resolve these issues because these conflicts are not going away. And um, Calder, the, dis uh, the dissent in Calder, really paved the way for that to say, look, Indigenous people have pre-existing legal traditions, legal rights, uh, jurisdiction over themselves, and, and a right to, to decide how they live, how, how, how culture is continued. And, um, and having that continued oppression by the Crown, by colonial governments and systems is, uh, is not um, something that the, the courts are comfortable in dealing with. And so we have section 35 as a, a kind of framework that was given to say, okay, well, these rights need to be protected. Um, clearly the legislation that exists is not sufficient. It's not being used in a way that gives effect to indigenous people's rights. Um, section 35 is you know, the, the framework for these conversations to, to happen. But over time, you know, we, we've got the, the section 35 itself doesn't provide the, the details of what that looks like. So it was left again to courts to, to fill in that, that, um, that framework and, and say, okay, well, how, how do we resolve issues between uh, governments and communities over things like land and resources and, and rights to, to decide for yourself what your community needs um, and wants. And so 
this conflict is ongoing. Um, and we see it, um, you know, in, in this, the context of the island forest, forest management plan, um, and the, the report that we've, I don't know if it's gone out yet today or it'll go after, I'll go out after this uh, meeting tonight. But that is a really clear example of just how we've got, we've got this constitution that doesn't say a whole lot about Métis rights. And we don't have law really that, that, that speaks to all of these complexities. And we've got really pressing issues in terms of you know, competing rights, competing interests, and, um, and, and you know, throw climate change on top of it and cumulative impacts and hundreds and hundreds of years of, of um, you know, uh, structural, uh, um, I guess, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use words that are too, too uh, depressing or, <laughs> um, you know, too, too full of conflict, but, but it is a form of, you know, genocide and, 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 and cultural genocide or whatever you want to call it. It is continued oppression by the government. It is continued um, looking for ways to get, get the conclusion that it wants. And Métis communities, and you see this in this report that, that we prepared, we're saying you need to involve Métis communities earlier in the stage. You can't say, here's the, here's the plan, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna chop down 64% or more of all of your trees. And you've got a month and a half to respond to three volumes of information. Uh, in the middle of winter, over Christmas, during COVID, and here's all the information, and and go and give us a response that you know whether that's actually going to result in a, another uh, opportunity co to consult, or if that report is just going to be put on the shelf and ignored. We don't know. We're still waiting for a response um, from our report, but in the past governments have taken those reports and put them on the shelf and continued with their course of action. Um, sometimes that leads to litigation in other provinces, there have, has been a lot more litigation than what we've seen in Saskatchewan. But, uh, you know, in, in, in looking at liability and looking at the, the law that has been developed in other provinces and the potential for litigation in Saskatchewan is, is huge. And Métis people, have a very strong, I think, argument to, to make in the context of the island forest plan anyway, of, uh, of cumulative impacts of, of decision making that has gone to a point where this is, this is fundamentally um, wrong and, and it needs to, to stop this, this process of I'm going to just come up with a plan and spend eight, nine years developing it and give you a month and a half to respond is not appropriate and it's offensive and it's dangerous. And if we wanna be talking about reconciliation in any kind of you know, reasonable manner, anything that's like even credible, you have to understand that, that, that the process for the duty to consult, the way that it's carried out in Saskatchewan is very flawed. And it's, I don't think, um, intentional you know and there we've, we've worked with some really great people people who care people who want to do the job and do it right but the 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 nature of the job is itself problematic and people's ideas of what what they're able to do within that job is is very rigid and restricted and if we're really serious about reconciliation we need to start thinking outside the box we need to start saying you know what this actually isn't fair, or this doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, there, maybe this, this, this didn't work. How can we do things differently? And we need to be involving the people who are affected by these decisions in, in deciding what that process needs to look like. Um, the duty to consult policy that Saskatchewan has is from 2010. And sure, there's policy manuals and um, you know, uh, discussions ab about what consultation should look like in a particular circumstance, but there's nothing solid and there's nothing that gives uh, the people who are carrying out the duty to consult, um, whether they're at the Aboriginal consultation unit and they're part of that procedural 
uh, administrative decision making process, um, or if they're the ministers or, or um, decision makers within the different ministries, they have to understand that that we are all responsible for doing things better and the way that things have been done to this point they're not sustainable and and they're not just and so i'll stop talking now but i just want that that to be the framework for or in people's minds when we're going forward and we're talking about what's happening to metis communities first nations communities in saskatchewan right now with the the government of Saskatchewan's forestry plans and sale of crown lands and restrictions on on hunting and the, the trespassing laws. These are very serious problems and Saskatchewan needs to have a, a real uh, hard conversation with itself about about Aboriginal rights, Indigenous peoples rights and and what that looks like in 2022. Thanks. Thanks, Caitlin. That was a great introduction. Um, I just want to say that uh, Caitlin uh, mentioned the Island Forest Report, and we will be posting the report um, following the speakers. We'll post it into the chat if you want to get a copy of it. Um, the second speaker tonight is uh, Jason Sirkan. Uh, Jason is an intern architect, was born and raised near Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. And Jason holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Carleton University. He completed his Master's of Architecture at the University of Manitoba in 2018. He has worked as a graduate research as assistant studying Métis arch architecture as part of a Social Science and Humanities Research Council grant and is a member and vice president of Fish Lake Métis Local 108 and a citizen of the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. He's been involved in many duty to consult processes with his community. And I'll just add that I know that Jason is a um, um, master hunter, fisher and trapper. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for, for the excellent introduction and, and providing some context for my presentation. Um, it's very helpful and, and thank you, Cindy, for the introduction. We're just pulling a presentation up here and um, I just want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules and, and sitting on Zoom with us tonight and, and we hope that uh, the presentation is kind of useful for everybody and, and that we can have some constructive kind of discussion after, after the presentation. So tonight I'll, I'll focus my presentation on um, specifically on like a, a Métis vocal community perspective. So more of kind of like a simple how to or guide to what a duty to consult process could or is. So if you go to the next slide, I've divided my presentation into, into four simple parts. Um, the notification and communication process, the review and research process, uh, responding to duty consults and, and the accommodation process. So on the next slide, I'm just give some very brief context uh, to Fish Lake. Fish Lake uh, Métis Local uh, 108 is located about 50 kilometers north of Prince Albert, um, near Emma and uh, and Christopher Lake, and it's in the boreal upland eco zone. So we're right in the heart of the, the boreal forest here. So if you go to the next slide, just yeah, thank you. Um, and one of the questions that we'll kind of respond to later is, is what did I want to kind of impart about, about Métis culture? And for our community, I, I want to kind of really stress that we actively kind of exercise our rights to sustenance, harvesting, and, and gathering of traditional medicines in our traditional territory. Uh, we live a modern sustenance lifestyle and we respect our lands as it provides spiritual, physical, and mental sustenance for our community members. Um, Fish Lake members were, were inseparable from our traditional lands. They form the basis of our identity and, and our culture. So I have a, just a collection of a, of a handful of images of some of the land-based activities we use and the materials and the things we create from, from these traditional materials. So if you go to the next, next slide here. Uh, the first section that I'd like to kind of talk about is just the uh, the notification and communication process. What happens? Uh, what, how are we notified, I guess, of, of a duty to consult? So on the next slide. Our community receives duty to consult files from, from a number of government of Saskatchewan departments. Uh, it could be forestry, it could be lands, it could be wildfire prevention or, or mining exploration or, or other departments. Um, and from our perspective, I guess there's two ways that the duty to consult uh, process is triggered with our with our community. 
Um, so this is from the consultation policy framework that was published in 2010 that, that Caitlin mentioned, and this kind of forms the, the current process of the duty, of duty to consult with our community. So, um, and when there's kind of a, a you know, a, a real uh, impact on, on our uh, sustenance rights and, and on traditional land uses as laid out in, in one and two here. Go to the next slide there. So I thought it might be helpful. I've redacted information from this just to protect the privacy of, of people involved in the duty to consult. It's just as general information. And, and I'm sure lots of you probably haven't, maybe, maybe you have, but maybe you haven't actually seen what a duty to consult looks like. So I thought it'd just be kind of simple to, to actually show like what, what is a duty to consult file. So this is, this is a file that came from forestry to, to our community um, on January 10th. Uh, they're sent out via registered mail to, to Métis locals and, and sometimes via email. Um, there has been some some issues with addresses and, and duty consults getting lost and, and going different places, but uh, typically they include important dates, a description of kind of the proposed proponent plan or work and, and maps of the proposed area. So if you go to the next next slide, you'll see. Yeah, so they'll, they'll provide small maps and, and printouts of, of the affected areas. So that's that's just kind of a standard duty to consult and, and we receive a number of these every year, um, sometimes. Uh, dozens of them a year. So there's quite a few that do come through. If you go to the next slide, uh, that kind of leads me into my second part of my presentation. Um, I want to just kind of discuss the review and research phase of the duty consult process from, from our perspective. So on the next page, um, I've noted um, Timing is typically an issue with the duty to consult, especially forestry ones. Um, I'm, they usually kind of come out at the start of the year and, and around January, and and we're usually typically required to, to respond in some manner within six weeks. Caitlin had, had kind of mentioned that and, and discussed that. What's really hard for us in forestry is, is winter access to a lot of these proposed cut blocks is, is incredibly challenging, expensive, and not feasible um, due to our winters. If you think of last winter, getting into some of these areas would, would be impossible without uh, a helicopter or, or, or extended periods of travel. So the other issue with this is that we're not able to actually conduct um, a proper review of these cut blocks for traditional foods and medicines. You know, there could be uh, endangered and threatened species. There could be medicines and, and foods that we use in our community that are under snow cover that aren't, um, we're not able to kind of do that in, in that kind of time frame in the, in the middle of the winter. So, uh, and then we usually end up having to request full scale maps or links of maps um, in PDF format. It's, it's a bit of a cryptic process sometimes, but we're, we're getting well versed in it. We're able to kind of access these maps on, online. But what we're finding is that they're not necessarily necessarily updated to the same level that the proponent is. So sometimes we find we're discussing something that's already changed, but we haven't been sent updated information on it. So the next slide, I'll, yeah, I'll go over the proponent handbook and, and consultation policy framework very, very briefly. Um, it's an, this is the proponent handbook. It's an 18 page document. It was published in 2013 by the government of Saskatchewan. Um, and it's kind of a voluntary engagement or, or good practice where the industry is kind of encouraged to meet with our community ahead of the duty to consult process. They give them a guide on what may trigger it. And, and they kind of like, they're supposed to meet with us and, and, and discuss, and maybe we can work together and collaborate, which I think a lot of the communities would be open to. This doesn't, doesn't happen all the time or regularly, but, um, but one, one really important distinction to note is that the duty to consult process lies between communities and the government of Saskatchewan, not between communities and industry. Um, and that's been muddied a bit in the past. And, and that's, that's a really important thing as a, as a Métis local, we, we don't have any duty to consult with industry on, on these issues that are, are the duty lies with the government of Saskatchewan. So if you go into the next, uh, next slide here, the, so then the, the other document that's really critical, probably more critical to understand in terms of duty to consult from, from a local perspective is, is a consultation policy framework published in 2010. Uh, it's a 20 page publication and it, it lays out uh, the, 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 idea, or, or the process that's, that's supposed to be followed for the duty to consult um, files between First Nations and Métis communities and the government of Saskatchewan. Um, and I just have some of the kind of objectives, uh, like respecting and protecting uh, treaty and Aboriginal rights, ensuring through the consultation process, subsequent decisions that negative impacts of these rights and uses are avoided, minimized or mitigated, and the rights are accommodated as appropriate. I'll go through accommodations at the end of the presentation. Um, 
and and then there's some guiding principles at the bottom as well. I'd encourage anybody that's involved in DoD consults to um, to download this. It's available online and, and really understand this. So the, the the government states that they'll act in, with integrity and good faith, respect um, government's duty, reciprocal responsibility, transparency and account accountability, and, and good communication. So if you go to the next slide, there, I'll move into my third section of my presentation, uh, which is. Responding to duty to consults, how does a Métis community or First Nation respond to, to a duty to consult file? So if you go to the next slide there, yeah. Um, so there's, there's, I guess the, other, the, the thing to stress here is that responding to a duty to consult file, it has no standard format. Uh, all the duty to consults that come in are different. They're from different departments and they're, um, they, they are different issues sometimes. Um, Oftentimes, we actually support, you know, some of these these initiatives that are going on, and you know, you can write a letter of support if you feel that it actually does capture your community's um, visions and goals, and it's actually you can find a way to work together, or you can um, ask for accommodation. So the our responses from our community they've they've varied from very simple single page letters. Uh, I mentioned letters of support, letters asking for accommodation, and in some cases we've we've produced um, reports that are well over 100 pages that are backed by both traditional and scientific peer-reviewed uh, knowledge. Um, but what's critical to note is that the response must specifically outline a potential negative impact to credibly claim sustenance rights um, by the proposed proponent plan. Uh, and then finally, um, what's really important to note on this too is that this is all volunteer work on behalf of community members outside of uh, our Métis local community members uh, day, day jobs. So it's quite taxing, taxing on the community to respond to duty to consults. So if we go to the next slide there. Uh, I just want to like share a bit of a case study um, for duty to consult just to kind of give a bit of context. We, we did a uh, comprehensive duty to consult uh, about 120 or 30 page report on, on forestry operations uh, in our traditional territory where, where we um, outlined issues that would impact our, our sustenance rights to access traditional foods, areas where community members hunt and, and trap and, and gather medicines. And um, this is just a small little backstory, I guess. Uh, this, when I was away at school, I, I would come home every, every fall to connect and connect with the land and hunt and, and put up traditional food for our family. And, uh, I traveled back to a clear cut where I had always hunted grouse as a kid and, and spent a lot of time and, and this is what I was met with. Um, I, I wasn't aware, I wasn't as involved in the duty to consult process, so I, I, I was quite shocked actually, I actually had to leave and, and go hunt somewhere else. Um, as you can imagine, there's no grouse left in, in this area, you know, in this cup block where I used to, you know, regularly provide uh, rough grouse for, for our family out of this cup block. So, this is kind of like an image of, of that standard form of uh, modified clear cutting that's, that's being practiced currently by the government and, and, and endorsed. So if you go to the next slide, I have another image of, of a modified clear cut. Um, that past image, I guess I should state, that was like a year, well over a year or two after it was cut. This was um, within kind of one operating year of it being cut. So just wanted to note the permanent damage to the soil and ground due to current logging practices in this image. So if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll show a, a positive case study um, that our community responded with uh, to the duty to consult process for that file that I had mentioned um, that was that was done last year. So what we did is we 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 went and did a lot of scholarly research. We had noted that the the at the time the the Prince Albert force management policy that was provided to us actually didn't reference any scientific data or have any work cited or references throughout. So. We were concerned with this and, and, and the route we took was to use academic peer reviewed and, and scientific knowledge to propose an alternative uh, logging method. We had met with the proponent as per like the proponent's handbook and we went up into the proposed cut blocks they were looking at and I asked them, well, what do you want out of here? And they said, well, we, we just we just want the, the softwood, the pine and the spruce. We don't want any hardwood. So I, I started doing research and realized that actually um, there was an example of it within 30 or 40 kilometers of the proposed cup block where they had done a shelter wood harvest where they had harvested 75 to 90 percent of the softwood and left all the hardwood uh, poplar and birch intact so they had done like a shelter wood harvest um, and i thought that this would be a good case study to kind of kind of pose to them you know because um because it had been done uh it was done 20 years ago so the top images are of it being completed and then the bottom two images are are kind of like um two three years later and then 20 years later 
Um, so I, I thought it would be a good precedent. It was backed by scientific knowledge and, and kind of research, but it was rejected um, because it did not support the current policy to clear cut. Uh, Doug will probably address this. So this was addressed in the, the island forced uh, duty to consult, uh, kind of the push for, for this modified clear cutting. So if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll go into the fourth part and wrap my presentation up here pretty quick. So the accommodation process, um, uh, the government has a duty to accommodate where, where there are you know, credible and, and negative potential impacts from the proponent on their proposed plan. So if you go to the next slide, I'll just go over this. You can kind of read through it briefly. This is in the consultation policy framework. Accommodation may include one of the more following, attaching certain conditions, uh, requiring proponents to adjust the activity or program, delaying may, making a decision or issuing approval pending further consultations and denying the application to actually conduct the activity. Uh, so this is this is how the consultation policy framework is, is supposed to serve our, our Métis locals and our First Nations. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it's my my last slide here. So um, then I just kind of want to state this to date, like our, our Métis local, we have not received any formal accommodation from the government of Saskatchewan to modify any clear cutting logging practices in their traditional territory. Um, then we've we've entered numerous duty to consult with the forestry unit. Um, the current operating plan and the, and the Prince Albert FMA has and continues to have a profound negative impact on, on our communities established and credibly claimed treaty and Aboriginal rights. Uh, it's having a profound impact on the physical and mental health of our community members, um, an irreversible impact. Um, we have had some success with, uh, with Star Diamond on a duty to consult where they did follow the consultation policy framework and it was a great success story. Our community left uh, left the consultations feeling uh, listened to, and we were accommodated. Star Diamond was happy that we were involved and engaged, and, and the government had a really good feeling that they had completed their duty to consult. Um, so there is there is precedent for four duty consults that we have done through the consultation policy framework that are, are good stories. And I guess that's kind of what I'll leave you with is that we can everybody can kind of benefit from from the duty to consult process. Uh, and everybody can kind of feel, leave feeling valued and everybody can feel um, respected and, and listened to. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Doug here to, to wrap up our, our discussion. And we'll move questions to the end. I had a question slide, but we'll, we'll take them at the very end. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jason. Um, our third speaker this evening, um, and following that we'll have a Q&A. Our third speaker is Doug Racine. Uh, Doug is a Métis lawyer with Aboriginal Law Group based in Saskatoon. Originally from Turtle Mountain, Manitoba, a Métis community, Doug has represented Indigenous people in duty to consult processes for well over a decade. His experiences vary from oil and gas pipeline proposals to nuclear licensing and to forestry management. Doug? Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Um, first of all, uh, yeah, I just want to review a little bit of what Cindy had said, and that is, is that I have been involved in a lot of duty to consults over the years, and um, and I want to what I want to do is I want to give you a perspective of of, uh, of what it's like representing an Aboriginal community in these duty to consults. <clears throat> so, when you start your duty to consult, the first thing you're going to do is ask for all the documents and the disclosure. In regards to uh, when I represented uh, Aboriginal communities uh, with pipelines or for the, um, uh, for the uh, um, Nuclear Safety Commission in regards to the licensing um, applications in Northern Saskatchewan, what would happen is they send you, um, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 file boxes Full of documents, and in those and in those boxes, you have engineering reports, you have ecological reports, you have biology reports, you have um, uh, just a plethora of reports, most of which are extremely technical. So, in order to you know, take a look at these and see if they're going to affect the community, you know, the decisions and stuff like that. In order to do it properly, uh, you would have to retain an engineer, you would have to retain a biologist, you'd have to retain probably four or five different professionals in order to understand what they're saying in those documents. 
Now, currently on these duty to consults in Saskatchewan, they're capped at $10,000. Uh, $10, well, and in, you know, over the years while I've been consulting, in, in some cases you don't get any funding and sometimes you do get some funding, but very, very little and not near enough to be hiring consultants. And it's certainly not a way, if you're running a law practice, uh, that you want to practice this very much unless your client is, has a lot of money because you end up um, uh, losing money very, very, very quickly. But in any event, the volume of documents that you get is unbelievable. And even if, for example, in this one document that you're going to get at the end of this, this talk, this island forest thing, there, that involved uh, a three volume set of the island forest plan. Well, if any of you care to do it, you can go online and, and, and uh, on the government website and, and, and look at those. They're highly technical and especially the volume two. And you, know, you don't have the resources or money to hire the technicians to help you understand. Um, <clears throat> so what you're forced with, if you're gonna represent a community is, is picking and choosing. Well, what you do is you identify the stuff you can understand and you read that. And you try and, you, and, you try and you know, get an understanding of exactly what's going on. Um, after that, once you have an understanding, I think Jason had talked about it before, you always want to visit the scene of the crime. Well, geez, if your funding is capped at $10,000, trying to get into some of these places, you can use the whole $10,000. Um, and, and that's really you know, what you want to do. You want to go in and take a look at those, you know what I mean, those areas. But it's virtually impossible because the money is just not there for you to do it. Um, uh, and then once you get an understanding of what's going on and, and, and what the proposal is, then uh, you need to communicate, communicate that to your, to your clients. So that means traveling to their communities. That means sitting down with them, spending hours with them. Uh, and, and trying to explain it to them. Um, I'll give you, give you a little story here. One time when I was doing a duty to consult with um, uh, the Nuclear Safety Commission on some licensing on some of the mines up north, um, we showed up to the duty to consult. It was held in a ballroom. And on the left side of the room is for the proponent and the right side is, was, for, was for us. So on the proponent side, you had the vice presidents and a couple of lawyers at their first table, then you had the engineers, then you had the biologists, then you had the environmentalists, the environmental professionals of some type, and then you had another table of another group of people and everything else. So that's, you know, 20, 30 people on the left side of the ballroom. On the right side of the ballroom is me and my client. So that gives you an idea you know what I mean, of what you're up against sometimes in these duty to consults. It's just about impossible to level the playing field. Um, and um, so, so it can get really difficult. Um, the other thing that you need, if you're gonna do these duty to consults is, is that you need office space. You need, printers, you need computers, you need a staff of some type to manage all the documents and to manage uh, the communications that you're having with your clients. And, and so you need that too. And, 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 and of course, that's not supplied uh, to an advocate like me um, to, uh, to uh, put everything together for your client. Um, I'll just give you another quick story about one thing that happened in, uh, in, on a pipeline duty to consult. We, were, um, uh, we went to this, uh, this consultation and one of the things the proponent had said is, is that the pipeline was not going to affect the Métis people. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And of course, in that process, I got to cross-examine. And 
what they do in that process is they put six of their um, six of their professionals up for you to cross examine. And it was really challenging because within those six, there was always a couple of spin doctors and you'd never get an answer for them. So you really had to focus on who was on that panel and who you had to direct the question to. So I did that. I weaseled out who was the uh, person that had wrote this. And I asked them, um, well, how many local Métis presidents did you talk to in coming to this conclusion that it didn't affect Métis? He goes, well, well, none. I said, okay, well, how many regional Métis presidents did you talk to in coming to this conclusion? And he says, well, 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 none. I said, okay, well, how many Métis elders did you speak to in coming to this conclusion? He goes, well, none. I said, okay, how many Métis people did you talk to in coming to this conclusion? He goes, well, none. I said, well, then how can you make such a statement? He says, oh, he says, we just phoned the province of Saskatchewan. So it can get extremely frustrating um, um, with the volumes of materials and some of the things that you have to work at to uncover, to, to, to understand, to try and understand if what they're saying is in fact true. And in a lot of cases, you don't have the time, the money or the resources to cover all your bases. So you're really, in a lot of cases, just going by the seat of your pants and just trying to do your best. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I wanna say, and I think it's, this has a bit to do with reconciliation. Uh, and I'll just tell another quick story. I was at a hearing, I was the fact finder at the hearing and this Aboriginal guy showed up without his lawyer. He was supposed to have his lawyer, but he showed up without his lawyer and uh, he wouldn't come in the hearing room. He was peeking around the corner and I, I said to him, well, well, you know, come on in. And uh, you know what I mean? Uh, come on in, uh, how you doing? He goes, oh, he says, I'm doing terrible because, because I've only been to this city like once or twice in my life and I, I live all around my trap line. And he says, uh, I had a hard time even crossing the street getting here. So I knew that his lawyer wasn't doing a very good job or looking after him or anything else. One of the things I had to do in the hearing was I had to talk to him about education. And uh, he came back and said, oh, I says, I'm just, I'm just dumb and, uh, I'm just dumb and stupid. I said, well, I said, well, you know, what's, you know, what happened in your education? He said, well, he said, Indian Affairs didn't find out about me until I was 13. And then they sent a float plane into the trap line because my grandparents were hiding me on the trap line and they sent a float plane in and they took me to a residential school way down south. And he says, I was 13 years old then and they put me in kindergarten. And he said, they got so frustrated with me they just made me do chores in the barn. I never ever learned how to read or write. So he says, I'm just dumb and stupid. So I said to him, I says, well, what if I took you out to the law school I went to at University of Manitoba and we walked into a room full of, a room full of law students and there's the professor up there teaching. Well, what would you think of that? He said, oh, I'd be scared because if that guy asked me a question, he says, I wouldn't be able to answer because I can't, you know, I wouldn't understand. I said, I'm just dumb and stupid. And I said, okay, okay, let's say that an airplane lands beside the law school, it was wintertime on skis, and they put you and that law professor in that airplane and flew you straight back to your trap line. Now, your job is to keep that professor alive for the next three months on your trap line. I said, who's the dumb and stupid one now? Who's the one with all the brains now? And you've seen a big smile creep across his face. One of the problems that you have in duty to consult is there's very little respect for traditional knowledge. And um, you know that because I've been to lots of duty to consult meetings where everybody from the proponent Uranium company or whatever, and, and engineering companies, and that everybody in the room is being paid. But the Aboriginal people are not being paid. 
But when you walk in the room, what do they say to you? Oh, we're so glad you're here. And you know, this traditional knowledge, it's so valuable and everything else. So when I complain about that, when I complained at this one duty consult about that, that I said, look, I said, my elder here is not being paid. Well, they said, well, how much should he be paid? I said, well, I don't know. I said, how much are you, how much are you paying that engineer over there? Because my client's contribution is every bit as important as that engineer's contribution. So there's a real fundamental imbalance in regards to the respect paid to traditional knowledge. And, and, and so that's also, that's also a, a barrier. I remember one time an elder said, well, that lake's contaminated because there's no bugs around it. And they came back and said, no, we've done all the tests. There's nothing wrong with that lake. So absolutely dismissed what my client was trying to tell them. And um, I'd, all like, I'd also like to say that a lot of what I'm talking about deals is, is, is also uh, applies to First Nations. You know what I mean? The, the, um, the, the duty to consult and the, the, the issues that we're talking about also applies to the First Nations. And, uh, and you can see just how difficult it is to operate uh, or to do a duty to consult. You don't see a lot of lawyers doing duty to consult because there's no money in it. There's, there's uh, it's, just, uh, it's just like hitting your head against the wall day after day after day. So in any event, that's my presentation. Thanks a lot. Doug, and uh, maybe we'll ask Caitlin as well if she could turn her camera on. And um, I'm teaching a class on community engagement here at the University of Regina, and my the chat is now open, um, so that the, so that anyone in the audience can post questions. But I'd like to start by entertaining five questions that were written by my students. And um, just ask Jason, um, Caitlin, and Doug if they could just respond to one or two of the questions. And then we'll move to other questions. And some questions have been also coming in just to the hosts, I know, um, as, as you've been speaking. So uh, so who wants to start? I can, I can open it up, I guess, the, the first question. Um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'll leave the later questions for for. Caitlin and Doug, um, and I, I, I had hinted this briefly at my presentation about our, our, our community members and a lot of Métis citizens are, are kind of trying to strike this balance between a modern traditional life, hybrid lifestyle. And it allows us to kind of participate in modern economies, but we strive to keep like our, our traditional ways of life and, and these kinds of practices alive and well in our communities. And I think that's really important to stress that uh, we're not we're not here to we can't, you know, go all the way back, back to a couple or a few hundred years ago and, and not participate in modern economies. So I want to understand like the importance too of, of forestry to our Métis families. My great grandfather was a sawmill operator and, and a logger, and, you know, and we don't want to negatively impact these, these small like logging operations. And we're just asking for things to be done in, in, a, in a better way, you know, in a way that our grandchildren and children will have a future and, and a long-term economy in this in the natural resource sector in Saskatchewan. It's incredibly important to Métis families and all families of Saskatchewan. So like I had kind of closed my presentation with, I uh, I just kind of wanted to stress that, that everybody can leave these duty to consults feeling good about it and, and everybody can kind of walk away winners uh, in, in these processes. So, and then I can start question two and pass it on to Caitlin and Doug. And, and I had stressed this too, that, the consultation process. I mean, what would I like it to look like? What might it include? I would actually, I just, I'd like it to follow the consultation policy framework properly. And that, that's, that's what I would like. And, and I've seen many of them that do not follow the, the consultation policy framework on the government side. So that, Caitlin and Doug, I don't know if you want to add to, to either of my first two answers there. I don't know if Doug's looking for the unmute button. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, yeah, I just uh, just want to add, you know, that 
that that people need to keep in mind that we are dealing with technological advances and changes and demands. Um, things are changing all of the time, and the expectations on communities to have the capacity to engage in some of these very complex uh, time restricted processes, it puts a lot of uh, uh, pressure on people. And when there are so many administrative um, hoops to jump through in terms of applying for the participation funding, um, so to even be able to, to have money to start working, it, it takes a lot of work to get to that point and it takes a lot of time. And there's, there's delay all of the time, there's inefficiencies and, and this is this is this impacts the Métis communities. It's 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 them that that carries that burden and is put at that disadvantage. And when we're looking at the increasing pressures of climate change, the the greater and greater need for research and monitoring and involvement of communities and understanding these issues that are so complex beyond what we've ever experienced before as as a human species. You know, we we have challenges of our time that we, we don't even really fully understand just how complicated and, and and potentially catastrophic, you know, things are in terms of the way that we're doing business right now. And we need to keep in mind that that things are changing very quickly and and we need to make sure that everybody is is on board for for thinking of of, of what uh, just transition looks like for Métis people, um, as well as, you know, the, the rest of, uh, of our, of our communities. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. I just want to, you know, of, of course, you know, the three of us could go on for hours with these questions and different things, but I'll just mention one little thing. On question two, it says, what would the ideal process look like what might it include? You know, I've always thought this and I've always wanted to do this, but if you're ever involved in these duty to consult with government, what they love to do or with businesses, they love to get you into a boardroom and then they like to PowerPoint you to death. I said in regards to the duty to consult, if I ever see another PowerPoint, I'm gonna strangle somebody <laughs> because what it is is that you're in their realm. Mm -hmm. They have control. And really, what I always thought would be a great duty to consult is, is that, you know, say, for example, up at Uranium City, is it that the community takes these company executives and these engineers and takes them out on the land, and that's where the consultation starts. And they can't get back unless they use the community's votes to get back, for example. You know what I mean? To change the, to change the, 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 the power dynamic. Um, um, so I, I just wanted to throw that in. Of course, I have a million things I'd like to say about, about uh, what would an ideal process look like, but I just wanted to make mention of that power imbalance where they put you in these boardrooms and they put you in, you know what I mean? It, you know, the duty consultant was proper in regards to, for example, Jason and I are dealing with a, a, a clear cut proposal right now. Well, you know what? We shouldn't really even doing that duty consult or if we do it, we should do it in the, where they're going to clear cut, you know, return, you know, to go back to that, that, that scene, you know, to change that power dynamic um, that you so often run into with the duty to consult. So there's just. Okay, thank you. Um, Megan's going to um, give us the questions, but maybe right before you start, Megan, I got one uh, that came during um, when the speakers were talking. And it came from Vince and he said, wouldn't it be in the best interests of logging companies or governments to map out all the areas, medicine, hunting, traditional use prior to the duty to consult? Or maybe it should be part of the process or assist the community in doing this. As many communities don't have the expertise, the funds, the resources to do all the review of the lands that they're being asked for, or that practice of their ancestors was also oral, and now they're being asked to give it in a written format. So if you can answer that, Caitlin. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I'll just oh. jump in here for a, uh, a second. In this duty to consult that we just completed, that we're going to 
hand over the, the document at the end of uh, this, they did a forest inventory. So they did an inventory of all the trees and what type they were and how big they were and how old they were. And it's arguable that they didn't do a good job about with that either because of the fact they were using such old data. But in any event, yes, there was an inventory for the trees, but where's the inventory for the hazelnut bushes? Where's the inventory for the blueberry bushes? Where's the inventory, uh, the inventory for all the, uh, well, the indicator species, you know? Um, there is no other inventory. And what that tells you is, is that industry and government are only focused on how much money is in the forest in regards to the trees. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin and go on mute. Right before you do that, could you just say what indicator species is? We, we want to try and break down. Indicator here. species. If you want to know the health of a forest, what you do is you take three or four species. So, for example, in the island forest, it's the moose, the Canada warbler and the, um, the Canada warbler and the uh, um, Fisher. Fisher, thanks, Jason. And uh, you monitor their populations. So that's uh, an indicator species. If they're healthy, ergo, the forest is healthy. Caitlin? Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, when we were thinking about how how much research we need in, to do in order to really understand the process. You've got industry um, telling the government essentially what is important and, and how to monitor it and um, providing that information that the government then relies on in coming to its conclusions about um, you know, what's a sustainable uh, harvest volume schedule, for example. And the, that process for determining you know, what, what is valued and, and how to value it is, is determined by industry and government before Métis communities, Indigenous communities are even brought to the table. And so when you're talking about species that are, you know, that are gonna be impacted, so the, the blueberries, the hazelnuts, the, the mushrooms, the medicines, all these different things that are important to the indigenous communities that are impacted by these developments. There, there's no, it's not uh, asking the indigenous people first what is important. It's the, the process that happens right now is the, the industry proponents and government tells, tells the, the, the communities what the, the, the scope of that research looks like. And so then communities are forced to try to work within the confines of a, a process that has already been determined without their input. And so how you get to that point of having the communities decide what is valued and, and how to value it um, and the, the research and support and capacity building to, to do that, that research and, and do something uh, practical with it afterwards in terms of policy making. Um, that's a that, that's a lot to ask of proponents to to do in terms of footing the bill, and there's very little government initiative to empower communities and an industry to work together to build that framework. We've got some examples of some some good work that's been done. Um, I know Isla Cross, for example, has done some really good work with the protected and conserved areas, and you know there are different communities across the province in Canada where they're taking that. Um, Th those steps to, to do their own community inventories and um, and and have that that research um, internally uh, prepared and ready to go, but that takes a long time and that takes a lot of money and expertise and uh, energy and there just isn't the amount of support that is needed in order to ensure that all communities can have that same resource uh, to rely on. Okay, thank you. Um... Okay, Megan. Hey, um, we have another question from Vince for Doug. Um, what did they find out about the lake that had no bugs? Doug, you're muted. You're muted, Doug. Yeah, I, 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 I can't remember what happened with that particular lake. Um, I'd have to go back and follow through my thing there, but 
but uh, um, but I'm sure that lake had no bugs. I'm almost positive. Um, um, uh, so, but maybe I'll get back to you on that uh, later, Vince. Hey, thank you. And then we have a question from Carl for Jason. Is there a path forward for selective logging to be considered in lieu of these large clear cut operations? Yeah, hi, Carl. Thanks for your question. Um, I would say definitely. Um, we could look at uh, uh, places in, in the boreal forest eco zone in Europe that are practicing these, these methods. We could look at lower impact logging methods. There's actually um, there's actually a number of, of small family run enterprises in, in my area that are trying to practice uh, shelter wood and selective logging harvest practices because they care about the land here. Um, so there's some some excellent people here that, that have set precedents. I did show a precedent. Uh, in my presentation, I'd be happy to provide that information. But there, there's a number of small family operations here in, in our traditional territory that are practicing um, better methods of logging to take care of the land. And, and they're actually being approached and penalized, or the government is starting to penalize these operations because they're not following, um, they're not following the, the, the policy goal, I guess, of clear cutting to mimic forest fire. Which, which if you do go through the, the latest Island Force duty to consult, you'll, you'll find some interesting findings on that, that we're, we're not convinced that it's actually founded on, on proper kind of information or, or facts to make that policy. So, so yeah, there's, there, there's definitely, like I'm optimistic that maybe, maybe we will look at that method or there's, there's a lot of precedent for, for that, Carl. And, and I'd really like to see that kind of implemented or at least tested here, you know, and, and I did propose an alternative logging method uh, as I went through my presentation and it was completely dismissed, so. Thank you. Um, and then we have, there's a bit of a discussion going in the chat. So maybe I'll just kind of to put it to the panel. Um, if anyone maybe wants to comment on the relationship between Métis Nation Saskatchewan and the duty to consult and Métis communities that are being approached with duty to consult. Um, I know that uh, the Métis Nation Saskatchewan is currently in litigation over some of these issues in regards to, to duty to consult. I really don't want to wade, wade uh, into it, but some of the things that we've mentioned are, are, are within that, that, that litigation that they're having with the province. Um, uh, uh, you know, yeah, it's got a lot of, a lot of the same things that we're mentioning, uh, that we're mentioning now. Um, there seems to be a bit of a uh, uh, what the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan now, I haven't, I'm not going to be absolutely accurate here, but here's what I think is happening. One of the issues is that the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan wants to consolidate the duty to consult to underneath the MNS. And what the government is saying is no, the duty to consult lies with the, lies to the, the locals. So they're having that, that debate right now. And I don't know how that's going to, how that's going to pan out. Um, um, I think that, you know, in ways, in ways, I think it could go either way. Um, and I have my own ideas about what that might look like, but I, I don't want to wade into that right now. Wendy's got her hand up there, Wendy Gervais. Wendy? Hi, good evening. Um, I'm an elected leader in the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. I'm regional representative, Western Region 3, southwest corner of Saskatchewan. So right now, currently, Métis Nation of Saskatchewan has and abides by uh, 2008, I think, duty to consult principles. And those duty to consult principles actually state that the duty lies, and this is prior, so it needs to be clarified, this is prior to the 2010 provincial government document. 2008, it was brought forward. Duty to consult lies at the local community level, which is the first impact, and then at the regional level, and then potentially the MNS to become involved. So currently right now, what is taking place, and I think we have some staff on here as well, is that most locals or regions are either working with duty to consult on their own uh, or 
they're actually asking MS for support. So my understanding is, is that MS is currently supporting some of the communities and or regions, but not handling all of duty to consult. And, um, and I think that's, that leads into another question and maybe another event, ladies and gentlemen, and that is, you know, where does the duty lie, right? Uh, you know, we know that it references community and I think that was commented at the beginning that we weren't going to discuss that. But, you know, where is the impact of community? And, um, and I think maybe that's what you were also referencing as well, Doug, that that now becomes not only legal, but political, right? So every, if we have 12 regions, every region is handling it a little bit differently. And um, I know that. I know in my region, duty to consult has been uh, being handled at the regional level. And, um, you know, I have a motion at my table, no different than, you know, uh, tribal councils or, or First Nations having banned resolutions. So I too have a resolution on my table that we work at the regional level. And I think the important piece to remember about all of this is the impacted communities, number one, and to ensure that any financial compensation, accommodations, uh, be it financial, be it jobs, you know, whatever, you know, whatever may be involved, that it really stays within the community, unless it's, you know, a major project across the province, that's a little bit different. But um, I know I dealt with a lot of um, potential DTC when line three was coming through. And my team had signed in with 30 different companies, had the, uh, not line three, sorry, KXL, had the KXL went through. So I think it's a, it's a touchy issue, as you said, Doug, and you don't want to touch it. And I will touch it as a community leader. And I believe that um, until we, until we as a nation come together and uh, figure out how we're going to handle this, I think it's it's left best in the community's hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go to Adrian's question here. Um, since the federal government enacted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, does it change Canada's existing duty to consult? And I can dive in on that one. Um, the, the United Nations Declaration, like first you have to understand that the, the version that the United Nations passed is not the same version that Canada has uh, uh, adopted or, um, you know, is going to be adopting. I don't know what stage of adoption and implementation uh, that is at uh, federally. Um, I know that provincially at, in BC, there have been some uh, there's a, the BC's version of the UNDRIP um, that they have gone forward with that has changed the relationship between uh, communities and industry and government. Um, that is still in, in, in its early stages, um, but they are revising their legislation and, and policies uh, to, to bring them in, in alignment with that legislation. Um, Possibly part of the reason why we're seeing BC logging companies move to Saskatchewan as we don't have those same kind of legislative um, constraints, perhaps, or, uh, you know, changes to business practices that are required by the, the new legislation. Um, and so, you know, the, the federal government's um, version of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People it, it, even though it isn't the same version, it, uh, it should impact how consultation um, occurs. And we have just not seen that yet in Saskatchewan in, in any kind of serious, uh, um, you know, any kind of serious approach or discussion about what that looks like in the Saskatchewan context. So um, just one point of clarification, you mentioned BC logging companies coming into Saskatchewan. Can, can we get some clarity around that? Um, sure, just, uh, you know, in, with the Island Forest, Forest Management Plan, uh, for example, um, the, the, um, the investment into Saskatchewan 
uh, for opening the PA mill, um, for um, you know expanding facilities to to expand the forest industry. That money is coming from industry, mm-hmm. and so and those companies are coming from BC. And BC is the logging is um, there's a lot more challenges there from the pine beetle infestation, from forest fires. And, um, you know, obviously the, the landslides and just the uh, difficulties that they're having environmentally uh, on top of all of the, the litigation that's happened out there and now legislation that is happening out there that is defining that relationship and those obligations of government and industry. Saskatchewan's kind of like the Wild West, you know, it's we're really silent on a lot of these issues. And so and the Saskatchewan government's approach right now is uh, we're cutting red tape and we're open for business. And whoever wants to come and put their money in into our economy uh, can can do what they want, essentially. Um, I mean, that's 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 the, the feeling that we get in our work. And that's uh, maybe not what they're they're trying to do, but that's kind of how people are perceiving it. And so consultation to answer Adrian's question, it should be different but it isn't, so. Yeah, and if I might just add a small, Adrian, thanks for your question. I, I have actually referenced uh, on DRIP, on duty to consult, uh, articles 2, 8B, 10, and 11 impacting our communities, and it was completely dismissed. Uh, okay, Megan, we're having trouble keeping up. Can we consolidate some of the questions if possible? Because there's yeah, a lot of so them. I, th- I hope so. Like there, there have been quite a few about the Métis Nation Saskatchewan questions. So I hope I've, I hope we tackled those ones. Um, we have another one here from Kathy and Lyle. Um, if the outcome of the duty to consult is unacceptable to the community, what repercussions are there for the company and or government if they go ahead with the proposed activities anyway? Um, I think the well, only option. Okay, go ahead, Doug. Well, you know, you know, the only option is to go to court. You know what I mean? And and uh, and that poses a lot of problems. And that's is where we're often beat. We're beat because the client does not have the two or three or four hundred thousand or a half million dollars to see this through to its end. So they beat you through you not having enough uh, resources to fight this through court. So. Um, litigation is where you'd probably want to go, um, but uh, uh, other than that, you know, I think you're reduced to having to uh, protest. You know what I mean? Unless Caitlin, you want to jump in there? Do you have any idea? I mean, I think that's where it's that's where it's at. But basically, when they shut you down and they don't listen to you, um, you're done. Yeah. Unless you're going to litigate. Litigation, uh, civil uh, unrest and, and protests, which we're, we're seeing more of both of those. Um, the only other avenue really is political change and asking our leaders uh, to, to do things differently. Otherwise, you know, it things are just going to keep going the same way that they have been. And uh, communities will eventually, I think, reach a a breaking point a tipping point like you can't keep doing this to people and expect there to be no repercussions and we're seeing that um, more and more uh, with the protests and and people standing up and fighting back so we need to we need to start working together and that has to come from the government has to come from our organizations and our institutions and and really include the community voices from the the ground up and uh, from the beginning um, putting them at, at the forefront of uh, the decision-making process. So we have a, a question from Kathy. I'm not sure, Cindy, is that me or Kathy? Oh, the other Kathy. Kathy, Kathy Pruden, whoever had their hand up. Um, I did, yeah, thanks. Well, it's okay, Kathy S., you could have asked, asked a question too. Um, first of all, I really wanna thank all of you for actually discussing duty to consult regarding Métis communities. Um, For many decades, um, us Métis have been the forgotten people. 
And although our knowledge is very alive and living and being passed on through our families and communities, uh, it doesn't appear so in many of the other outside circles. Um, a couple things that Doug had talked uh, about, it was, and it's good to see you, Doug. I haven't seen you for a long time. Uh, when you brought up that, you know, the resources aren't there and they expect you to go to a ballroom and they have all their technicians set up on one side and we have, you know, three traditional individuals, um, long family line of, you know, trapping, hunting, medicine gathering, all of those things. Well, what is stopping us as Métis people or as people, not just Métis, of actually kind of re-establishing our traditional knowledge in a formal way that, no, you have to come before our panel. You have to come and you have to tell us why that's the best idea. Because that's the way they used to do it. I mean, if we're talking old laws, you know, the, the, the law of the hunt was survival, right? And it's, if it's got to change, then you guys got to tell us what proves that. And you guys have to argue to us. We're the keepers of the land. Like, I, I just think we're exhausted. You know, I, I'm the regional director for Western Region. Kathy, I'm just going to ask if you can get to your question, just because there's 30 so, some questions. So. I guess my question is, it's not just a matter of money resource. It's a money of, or a question of collecting um, all of these traditional knowledge keepers in with their lens and projecting it through their lens. How could we do something like that? Yeah, um, I just like to, I, I think that was absolutely wonderful. Wouldn't that be great? They'd have to come to our Métis communities and then, and, and then, and then ask you know, ask permission. Um, the problem with that is, is that the Canadian government and the courts do not have the, the, they don't want to give us the jurisdiction. As soon as they give us the jurisdiction, then they lose control over, over the, uh, the resources and they will fight to the end of the day to make sure that that doesn't happen. But I love the idea and it's a great thought trying to go to sleep at night thinking that something like that might happen. But I thought, you know what I mean? That's just, that thought of that happening is just absolutely, um, you know, warms my heart. And uh, thanks very much, Gavin. Megan? Hey. Um, okay, so there's, there's, there's a lot more discussion in the chat kind of about the Métis Nation Saskatchewan question, but, um, I think one of the maybe we could tackle here is just the question of if putting this at the local level um, maybe it potentially plays into the hand of like colonial government. Um, yeah, so thinking about, I guess, thinking about this question of um, being kept at the local level, what are the implications of that? So the implications of keeping this decision, these uh, duty to consult at a local level. Any one of you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak up. If you want to keep the consultations at the local level, regional level, or even at the top of the M and at Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, the big thing is, is, is that, and I'm not going to wade into what is right and what is wrong or, you know, where it, where it should be. I mean, I have my own idea of where it should be, but it's a matter of having resources and responsible people. There are hundreds, if not thousands of duty to consult letters right now that are being filed in the garbage because the local doesn't know what to do with them. Um, um, not being picked up, the reg there's some locals that are not picking up their registered mail. I know this for a fact because what they think is, is if they pick up the registered mail, then the duty to consult clock starts ticking, right? So they're not picking up their, their registered mail and they're, they're, um, um, so there's all sorts of stuff like that going on. So 
what you need is you need resources and responsible people that will go out there and make sure that each of these duty to consults is dealt with. And, uh, and uh, so my big concern is not so much where it is, as long as there's a responsible organization that is going to look after these duty to consults and look after our communities. Now, with all that said, if it's held at the local level, are the lo is the local level going to be able to access the resources that they need? right, to do a proper consultation. And right now, where they're limiting each local to $10,000, it ain't gonna happen. Okay, thanks. Another question, Megan? Well, there's a comment here that I think is interesting and maybe folks on the panel wanna weigh in. Um, Dave has just mentioned that there are huge issues that their local is consulting on. Um, and one of them is the sale of unceded territory. So maybe if anyone on the panel wants to discuss that or if Dave wanted to elaborate. Dave, Dave are you here? Hi, go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Hello? Yeah, we're, you're on. First of all, I'm going to apologize I am in the sticks and we have the worst uh, Wi-Fi. So if I'm, <laughs> um, you know, j just for instance, I just wanted to touch base on just a couple, you know, um, it's the timing. It's when we're brought into the consultation process, you know, in say in regards to um, the sale of unceded territory. They'll, we'll be asked, how will it affect your, your local directly? Or are there, um, you know, will it, will it affect your ability to hunt, fish, gather, you know, you know the, the, the parameters that they put you within with, with the consultation framework? But yet, why weren't we consulted on, on whether it should be sold in the first place? You know, uh, unceded territory. Well, that's that's potentially there for for future land claims, or um, you know, with, with the First Nations. Well, the bands are getting bigger. You know, they need more territory, but yet um, these land and the the way they're going about it as well. You know, there's small little parcels here and there, and it's 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 like a death by a thousand cuts, and uh, even you know. In regards to the um, the island forest, you know, the island forest being it is such a fragile, fragile ecosystem, and it, it can't it it won't survive. You know, clear cuts. There has to be another way, but the um, the Ministry of Environment, even in, within the the um, the management plan, they're, they feel that it's, it's all right. You know, if it reverts, if it doesn't go back to a forest and, and um, fescue grassland takes over, you know, it's, for them, it's a, it's a calculated risk, you know, a calculated risk. Well, they're, they're, they're doing the calculating and we're taking the risk, you know, hmm. but anyway, I, I just wanted to touch base on 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 those types of, you know, it is the timing. Whenever there's a, 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 we should be brought in sooner, and engaged with sooner, because you know it's like they've made a decision to on a destination. Okay, should we go to, you know, um, you know they they make a decision, say to go uh, to Saskatoon right? That decision's made. And then they come to us and they ask us, well, we've decided to go to Saskatoon. How would you like to get to Saskatoon? Are we going to go to Saskatoon via Shelbrook or via Prince Albert? You know, it's, uh, I, I, hopefully that's not a poor example, but it's, it is, and it's, um, it, you know, uh, that's, that's all I had to say. Thanks a lot, Dave. And we know you're coming, you're, you're, you're coming from, from, Island Lake Forest, right? Is that where you are? 
we are right in the in the heart of uh, the island forest. We're I'm this is the Métis community of, of Crutwell, Saskatchewan, and but the, unfortunately, the harvestable timber here has has been taken. We've seen the repercussions of of forestry mismanagement. Um, you know, they came in, they took everything. Um, it was clear cut, and then they replanted with a, a jack pine monoculture throughout our area, and um, you know, leaving the whole forest um, susceptible to to uh, mistletoe, and and that's what we live in now. You know, um, the scarification process that they used prior to planting destroyed our our historic sites and and spread artifacts throughout. You know. So we've we've seen it. We're we're when we speak to the Ministry of Environment, we we speak from a position of the no. You know, the, the, these aren't um, computer generated. Um, you know, it's these are facts. This is this is what we see. And when we and when they come to us, when they come to our our meetings, they they can't speak. They can't. They have nothing to say because it's you know we're we're not. Um, we're not using computer generated models. We're not using, we're living in the repercussions of irresponsible forestry. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, Caitlin, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just uh, want to um, make a couple of points. Um, just to, to remember that the duty to consult process is a, is a procedural process, it is a procedural remedy. Um, that that is not intended to give substantive remedies. So when you're talking about land, you know, rights to land, substantive rights to, to own and occupy and make decisions about property, um, title, you know, th those are questions that Canadian courts say, oh, we have to consider that at trial. Those are evidentiary issues. We need to have a full trial to decide rights, decide entitlements, decide responsibilities. Um, and the duty to consult process is, is, not, is not appropriate for those kinds of questions. So we've seen some litigation, uh, you know, Delgamuk uh, is an example of a claim that was brought and the courts went up to the Supreme Court of Canada and they said, this is not the appropriate forum. And, you know, yes, this uh, could be decided, but they send it back. Um, and they, they force people, the courts force communities into this consultation process. And, um, and it's, it was never intended to give those substantive remedies that communities are actually looking for. And so when you're given a duty to consult on a land sale, the decision's already been made, like Dave said, right? The, the decision to sell has already been made. And so how are you supposed to even think of engaging in that consultation and how we can you say it's meaningful when you're talking about actually losing the land completely. Can you, um, I know that no one has really addressed on the panel the scope of, of the logging uh, in the island forest. What is the scope? What, what are we talking about here? Well, what we've got right now is uh, there, the um, of the, the island forest, it's four provincial forest areas. And the, the, the 20 year plan that the government has put forward, it, it permits up to 64%, I think, of, uh, of harvesting um, the, the forest resources in, in 20 years. Um, but there's, there's the one harvest volume schedule, and then there's the alternate scenario that allows for a different amount to be cut. And it's not clear exactly how much they're gonna cut or where they're gonna cut, how, how quickly, um, you know, when they're gonna require companies to replant or, or, or regenerate. It, it's very, um, it, it's, not, it's not concrete. So we, we think about 64%, but it could be more. And these trees oh. were not coming back. So that's another part of it is that We've got 33% of the area it has, is deemed not sufficiently regenerated. So over the last 20 years or so of, of harvesting, those trees are not coming back. And 
they don't have enough money in the trust fund to, to replant the areas that are already failing and they want to cut, you know, 64% more without even addressing the huge gap or, or, or the, 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 the losses that we've already experienced. Okay. Are there any more questions, Megan? Maybe we have time for maybe one more. Um, we have one from Tegan here. Is there a legal case for how the cumulative impacts of so many small projects or individual consultations are impacting harvesting and gathering rights? Um, yeah, there's uh, a few cases um, that we can look to. Um, I know from Saskatchewan context, I think carry the kettle. Um, there was, uh, oh, what's the other one I'm trying to think of? No, there's an, there's a, a couple um, that uh, are, are ongoing or they, they haven't really progressed very far. And in terms of other provinces, we've got Blueberry, um, the Blueberry River First Nation decision that came out recently that deals with cumulative impacts and the government uh, it was a favorable decision for the community and the government decided not to appeal. So that restricts the, the, the holding of that decision to the, you know, to a very limited context. If it's appealed and appealed and appealed, it could end up being a law that applies to all of Canada and, you know, heaven forbid that uh, that cumulative uh, impacts law um, applies uh, across the pro or across the country. And, and the, the decisions that we have are also, you know, with respect to, to treaty rights, um, or, you know, if we've got title legislation, um, not a whole lot of, of law on Métis rights and cumulative impacts in particular. So it is an area that is up and coming and there's lots of potential uh, litigation in this area for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jason or Doug, did you have any response to that? Okay. Um, Maybe one more. Okay, one more, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just one from from Robert here. Um, okay. If, if someone could just expand a bit on the process of accommodations and what they should encompass. Anybody want to talk about accommodation and what it what it could include, or maybe I, I any comments on that? Yeah, uh, just that I think accommodation. I'll go first, Jason. I'll just make one comment. Accommodation has a lot to do with this fact specific uh, damage that was done. So would it have to be done on a case by case basis? Um, you know what I mean? I think that Jason, you included that in your in your slideshow. Where, uh, which you might want to speak to now. Yeah, thanks, Robert, for your, for your question. Um, it, it is laid out in that consultation policy framework, and I did include it. Um, it can take many forms, as Doug said, and it's usually treated like very specifically to the issue at hand. So you need to prove that there, there is a potential negative impact to the community. I could use the example of, uh, of, of an elk hunting area that, that we had a diamond exploration proposed in, and um, we were actually we were accommodated on that uh, by the government and, and what they had done is they were planning to, to drill an area um, actually right in the middle of, of the elk rut <laughs> where community members would, would be hunting. And uh, we were able to, to ask them to change their flight pattern. They had about six pads and wanted to drill. They wanted to start at the south and work their way north. And and uh, their first south pad was directly directly where community members would be elk hunting basically on that day that they had proposed to start their work plan and and we worked with with them and we ended up flipping at 180 and they started on the north pad about 25 kilometers north and we had community members that hunted in there throughout the season and they never heard a helicopter and they never saw a helicopter they changed their flight pattern for us slightly um so so that's like a very specific example but in the consultation policy framework i mean they can they can attach conditions and they can make the proponent adjust their plan they're very apprehensive to to do this especially in forestry i don't think they want to set precedent for accommodation we haven't actually received an accommodation we did have a proponent move cut blocks back one year we actually thought the government had accommodated us because it wasn't clear that's another issue with their accommodation and there's there's no kind of follow-up correspondence or report at the end of the duty to consult process from the government were kind of left in the dark in terms of what may be accommodated 
forestry they approve plans on on march 31st and they won't commit to telling us what the accommodations may be before prior any indication so you kind of go into march 31st completely blind you know wondering if they'll be in there in april clear cutting this this horse block or if they totally cancelled cancelled it till the next year so caitlin's got more to add here yeah just uh you know, another example um you know that can kind of give you a a, a way of 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 comparing what people who like say save the island forest uh forest management plan the government was required to consult with the public um, in the development of the plan there's a legislative requirement in the forest resources management act i think it is that requires the government to consult with the the public in making decisions about how to use forest resources so the public was engaged at a very early stage in in by, by the government to in in this process of developing the the voids the values objectives indicators targets um you know the the things that um the the whole plan is is built around and they there were multiple sessions community engagement sessions that occurred over the course of many years like from 2013 and on and it wasn't until you know the i think some notices had gone out for uh, um to communities to consult after volumes one and two were already done. So the Voits and the initial public consultations, everything was already done. Um, those notices didn't go, they weren't received by a lot of communities or several communities that we talked to, they had no idea. And it, it's not until, you know, years later, like I say, when the plan is already done, a month and a half left to respond where communities actually just kind of by chance happened to find out that this plan this 20-year harvesting plan was uh what was in the works and the the deadline to, to respond was you know within a matter of weeks and so when you're thinking of accommodations how is it that the public who has a legislative right to be engaged is included so much earlier than people with constitutional rights to be engaged um how how is that how is that fair and so accommodations need to be they need to be reasonable, you know, and, and think of it from as it for a basis of comparison, what is it that other uh, stakeholders are getting in terms of, um, you know, accommodations and inclusion into the process and then think, well, what are, what are we doing for our, our Indigenous communities? Is it the same? Um, it, it isn't, you know, so hmm. that's a good place to start. Okay, so, um, and I think, you know, it might be interesting to everybody if you get a copy of the report. I understand we had a little bit of trouble uploading it into the chat. So we will email it out to everybody. Uh, I, I think Lynn, correct me if I'm wrong, we can do that. And um, so you'll all get a copy of the Island Lake, um, the, the response of uh, on Métis consultations on duty to consult with, I guess it was five, five locals involved. Am I right? Okay, so um, you can expect that in the next couple of days. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, if um, I know there's lots of stuff in the chat, I'm looking forward to reading it later. And this uh, session has also been recorded and it will be made available on the website of the Community Engagement Research Center. So I think when we send out the email with the report, we can also include a link of where the recording is available. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you so much, Cindy, for organizing this event and everybody who is involved. Um, this has been a really, really good opportunity to have these hard conversations. So, so thank you for, for hosting and putting it together. Thank you. And if people want to put on their camera and, you know, then they can wave goodbye to each other. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Until